So my name is Drew Dalton. I am the founder and chair of Report Out, and I'm also a senior lecturer in sociology here at the University of Sunderland. And I just want to say thank you all for coming. And for those who are online as well, beaming in from around the globe, um, we have people coming in online at every single talk today and throughout the day, which is really exciting. Um, and we know we've got people joining online from places as far as Kenya to China, which is great news um, and really exciting to see. So I want to start off by saying that we had a fantastic launch night on Tuesday night for those who were there. Um, at the National Glass Centre, we were proud to host for the first time in the United Kingdom ever, the Amsterdam Rainbow Dress, which for those people who don't know, is made up of flags of all the countries in the world that criminalise same-sex uh, um, same sex acts. And every time a, a country decriminalizes, that flag is then removed from the dress and replaced with a pride flag. So, slowly but surely, the dress will eventually become one huge pride flag all the time, as we see the dominoes dropping around the world, which is great. Um, my speech then was a little bit more fire and brimstone, um, a little bit more what the world is looking like. But today we've got Mark. Who is who's far more informed than I am and an excellent author. And I'm a personal groupie of Marx. Um, and you'll find that in your bag that you have, you have a copy of Mark's book, which we give you all for free as well. So do enjoy it. It's an excellent read. Um, so to be very brief, um, the reason why we're doing this is because this originally was going to be a UK government conference. It was going to be called Safe to Be Made. Um, until, as you may have seen on the news, the UK um, uh, government, as led by Boris Johnson then, um, had promised us for a long time a ban on conversion therapy. And that never materialised. Instead, what we got was a, um, a partial ban, which only would include lesbian, gay and bisexual people, not people who are trans, non-binary or intersex. And uh, as a result, we pulled out the conference. We were meant to be part of it. And a lot of other organizations came out of it as well and refused to join it. So the conference never went ahead. So we thought, okay, with a significantly smaller budget, <laughs> with a little bit of love, and as I said at the launch night, a little bit of glue and sellotape holding things together, we'll do our own. And we, this is why we call it Safer to be Made, as a little pun on the government Safer to be Made conference. Um, so I really hope you enjoy the day and I hope you get the value from it and I encourage you all to stay toward the end because I've got a special announcement where we'd like your involvement at the end of this. Don't just enjoy the day then go home. Um, do come back for the plenary. We would like your involvement to take this further and to share knowledge. So I hope you like your tote bags. Everything in there is sustainable, recyclable, all that great stuff, which is exciting. Um, so don't throw them away. Well, if you do, it should buy or be great. But in good news, around this room, you will see placards. This is what's called the flag, flag in the map exhibition. Um, this was a partnership we had with Gilbert Baker Foundation, the creator of the pride flag in the USA. Um, these placards were sent in by people from all over the world. And I just want to draw your attention to a few of them that you may see. So I think it's at the back, the one that really stands out for me is the one from China. Um, and it's a group of people on bicycles and they had to go out at about 6 a.m. in the morning before the government called them flying the pride flag. Um, it was an amazing piece to get out there. And we won a global award for this. Um, and we very proudly for our tiny little charity um, said we, we beat Google for global campaign of the year. We're really happy, we beat Netflix. We're like, Wow, holy crap. Um, and these have just came from Northumberland Pride. You can actually hire these placards to go in your community center, to have at your events. Um, we don't charge for them other than pay your own delivery and return them back to us nicely, please. Um, but if you have a school, college, university, community center, or whatever, you can use these placards and use their time out today to read the story. Some of them are tremendously optimistic, others are heartbreaking. Um, and they're coming from everywhere, from the Kakuma refugee camp in Kenya, right up to Malta. And you'll notice Tanya Stevenson with the largest trans flag in the world, officially, um, carrying it, which is a, an act in itself. Um, we also have, we made these placards into a beautiful book as well, um, of all of these stories, because there are more than these, there's 200 in total. We have 50 printed. 
If you'd like to buy a copy of the book, uh, we're selling them for £20, cash card accepted at the registration desk. Please buy a copy or the money goes towards the charity. Uh, to us and to Gilbert Bay. So we really hope you stay all day and evening with us. Um, we have three lots of talks and three separate rooms going on simultaneously. Most are face-to-face, -face, but for different reasons, visa reasons or whatever, we may have to be in some people in on la uh, live. So at this point, I'm going to humbly step down. Now I've done all the information bits, and I'm going to hand over to the wonderful John Timmis, our Deputy Vice Chancellor. Morning, everyone. Um, I'm not sure I have all of that. Actually, so much for your five minutes. I really will be five minutes <laughs> there on, on that. So as Drew said, my name is uh, Professor John Timmis. I'm the Deputy Vice Chancellor here at the University of Sunderland. And as part of my portfolio, I lead on our equality, diversity, and inclusion work as well. Um, and so it's a real pleasure for, to be here this morning to welcome you to the university. Uh, for those of you here for the first time, uh, it's always like this in Sunderland. It's always warm. Uh, it's always <laughs> sunny, uh, and uh, this is just like normal, really, to be, to be quite honest. And for those of you who couldn't make the trip over for various reasons, then you're missing uh, a heat wave. If you do get a chance, um, I'm not going to kind of compete against your film tonight, which sounds great, but we do have some fantastic beaches here in Sunderland, which you might not realise if you haven't actually been about a mile just slightly north of here. And there's two or three miles of wonderful coastline and beaches. So if you do get a chance to go and have a look and a walk on the beach, then I would encourage you to do so. Said so I'm really uh, delighted and really proud um, to be hosting this here at the university. Drew asked me about kind of hosting this a while ago now. I forget. I can't quite remember. Uh, and with uh, notable Drew enthusiasm, it was very hard to say no uh, in terms of uh, having you here. So it's a real pleasure to have you here with us today. And just a little thank you on our behalf to the organising team, uh, Drew and the rest of the team for organising it. A huge amount of effort goes into organising events like this. If you've ever done one before, you, you know what I mean. It's a lot of work, and so it's really nice to see it come together in, in one thing. Our university mission here at, the, at, at Sunderland is to be life-changing, and we take that really seriously. It's our kind of motto, if you like, our vision. And we mean life-changing for our students in terms of giving them opportunity that they might not normally have had, um, to kind of further themselves, get a new career, and move on in their lives. We also mean life-changing for society, and particularly the city and the region in which we are based. So the University of Sunderland is what we call a civic institution, so we take our role in society incredibly seriously, and we work tirelessly with the city council, the regional authorities, and different kind of charitable organisations to make a difference. And so making a difference is what we're all about here at the university. That's why having symposia and events like this is so important to us, because I think it's events like this where you can come together, you can discuss, and you can try to make a difference and think about how to move society forward. And that whole thinking, that whole research for me is vital. Um, those discussions are absolutely vital in order to bring new ways of thinking, challenge thought and challenge each other, but, and drive ourselves forward. So for a university to be hosting it, it's exactly the right kind of thing to do. In terms of the role of universities, I think hosting, hosting events like this, we, are, we encourage free speech here. We, know we have a legal obligation anyway, but that's something that we would do. And so we're very delighted to be able to have people come and discuss topics that sometimes people find difficult to discuss. You know, we've had various conferences before where, you know, sometimes having conversations, and I see this in my role partly when we're talking about issues to do with gender or sexuality or disability or any, any a lot of the uh, characteristics, sometimes people find it challenging to have conversations. And but we like to encourage that. And so today, I really encourage you, and I know you will, I can get a sense already, that actually those discussions are going to be fruitful and they're going to be interesting, engaging, exciting, but also challenging. And that's something I always encourage people to do at conferences and this is challenge each other, you know, and but in a good positive way, because that's actually what, you know, from an academic perspective is what it's about, is challenging that thought and being open and being free to be able to do that. And so for me, that's really, really important. I was reflecting a little bit when I was thinking about what to say here uh, this morning, you know, often they roll people out like me, you know, to say welcome to the university and think that Goodness me, what I'm saying, you know. Um, but I was reflecting a little bit. You know, I'm of an age where I 
I was a teenager in the 1980s uh, in the in the UK, and so I'm yeah of a certain age. And um, the I was um, when I left school. I left school early at 16 actually, and I went to I'm actually a, a classically trained chef, believe it or not, even though I'm a deputy vice chancellor. But my original trade was was one of a chef, and I went to Catering College uh, in a place in, in, in England. And at the time I met, there was a friend of mine, his name was Pete, and he was the first openly gay person I'd ever met. Uh, because where I grew up, it just, you know, it just was in the 1980s, early 1980s in particular, then it's something that just wasn't really talked about too much. And this was the first person I, I met. He was, and, uh, and his partner was really sad, actually, reflecting. And his partner um, had such kind of, uh, was, went through, went through a very challenging period in his life and ultimately took his own life couldn't cope with the, with the pressure and the kind of the, um, the stigma that seemed to go along at the time in the 1980s. It was really, really tragic, absolutely terrible. And, and I reflect now and I think looking, looking where we are as a country, I think we've changed quite a lot. But as we know, and why there are sessions like this, it's still not kind of where we want it to be. You know? um, despite all the advances, all the changes that have made, you know, our country still, as Drew said, you know, where it's illegal, you know, to have same-sex relationships. Yeah. Thankfully, that's not the case here. Yeah, but it is in many countries. But there's still kind of um, kind of stigma and kind of uh, feelings of uh, inequality that go through society that are just unacceptable. In my view. So I'm trying to think. Yeah, we. Yeah. Yeah. You know, it's just unacceptable. You know which is why having events like this are just so important to us. And that's why it's genuinely a privilege to be able to host you here today. It really is. So I encourage you to engage, be enthusiastic, with Drew around, I'm afraid. You've got no chance but to be enthusiastic. Uh, I have learned that over the many years of being here. It is impossible not to be slightly infected by that infectious enthusiasm. Um, do enjoy your time here. I hope you get something out of it. I hope you enjoy your time and I hope you have fond memories and leave Sunderland of Sunderland being a great place to be. Thank you very much and enjoy the rest of the day. Okay, on that note, we would love to hand over to Mark Kibiza, who's going to be our wonderful keynote until uh, just before 10. So there's an opportunity here to ask questions at the end if people have questions for Mark as well. So I'm going to hand over. And uh, it's, I'm really sorry I'm not in the room with you there in Sunderland. I've never been. Um, I'm, a, I'm a great admirer of the work of Report Out and um, uh, of Drew uh, and all of you uh, in terms of the way uh, you, you work with international solidarity. And I think what is so special about Report Out and about what you're doing with this conference is your, the symposium is your um, commitment to looking outwards, to, to understanding what you deal with um, as LGBTQ people or queer people in the United Kingdom uh, as part of a global orbit organism. And, and it's really that, um, that global organism that I'm interested in as, as a researcher, as an activist, and as an author. I am South African, I am, and I come to you now from Cape Town, from sunny Cape Town, um, sunny Cape Town to sunny Sunderland. Um, I wrote this book uh, from the perspective of the global South because I'm South African, because I live in South Africa. And, 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 and the way this book came about is, is that um, I, I'm, I'm of the same generation as the Deputy Vice Chancellor. I am queer myself. And when I was growing up, I had no um, conception of how much the world would change in my lifetime. And, and as I hit my mid forties and, 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 and my fifties uh, at the turn of the millennium, I, I became increasingly interested in trying to understand why attitudes towards sexuality and gender identity had changed so dramatically in a generation, uh, why this had happened and what the effect of this was. And, and, and so I set out to, to asking those questions, traveled the world um, for many, many years uh, with the help of a grant from the Open Society Foundations. And, and, and through my research, I came up with this notion 
uh, that, that in our time, in, in the early 21st century, in this new millennium, that there was a new pink line that was describing, defining, and dividing society in ways that were, were really unimaginable when I was young and coming out and coming up in the world. And, 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 and I, what I do in my book, and I'm, I'm really, really thrilled that you all have a copy of it. Thank you so much for that, Drew, and report out. What I do in my book is, is I look at this pink line and I, I try and understand how this pink line runs between countries. And we're gonna look at that in this talk. We're gonna look at how, how the pink line uh, runs, for example, between Western Europe and parts of the former Soviet Union and Eastern Europe, where on one side of the pink line, uh, queer people are increasingly included and, and celebrated and affirmed in all their rights. And on, other side, on the other side of the pink line, almost in reaction, uh, they're being uh, increasingly shut out. We could see how that pink line, as we talk about running between countries, we could see how, how it runs between um, uh, uh, the former colonial powers and African countries, and uh, how in the case of countries like Uganda and um, Nigeria, um, there are laws that are being passed uh, specifically in reaction to the increasing freedom that queer people have in, in other parts of the world. But if the pink line runs between countries, it also runs through countries, of course. And, and we, we see that in the United Kingdom. We see that increasingly in the United States, as I'll talk about. We see that, of course, in countries like Uganda and Nigeria and South Africa, too, where, of course, there are queer people and where, of course, there are many people, an increasing number of people, who, who really do believe in the right of everybody to be themselves. And we'll talk about that. My book also looks at the way the pink line runs between city and countryside. Very importantly, how it runs between generations. And, 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 and that's critical when one, when one wants to try and understand how the world is changing. And, and why it is that, that, that some countries have moved um, more quickly than others. Um, when it comes to affirming and granting the rights of everybody. A lot of it has to do with pressure that comes from a younger generation uh, and, and the younger generations changing attitudes and ideas. And this is linked to, to the final uh, way that I track the pink line in my book, which is between online and offline. And why do I say that that's linked? Because um, so much, one of the big reasons why we've seen such a dramatic change, such a new conversation in, 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 in our generation is because of the digital revolution and because of the way that, that younger people in particular uh, use information technology and go online and are able to find a certain kind, not just information, but a certain kind of freedom online. So there's, there's, a, there's a pink line that exists between that kind of freedom that you, or, 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 or that community, or that information that you can have online. But what happens when you, when you come offline again and you have to deal with the reality of the world around you? When you look up from your, your smartphone where you, where you are, uh, are connecting with other people, where you are finding about, out about trans medicine, where you're hooking up on Grindr, when, when you look up from that phone into the eyes of a, of a, a father who says that who punishes you into the eyes of a priest who says that you're a sinner into the eyes of a state that says that um, what you're doing is illegal you can see how there's a pink line between online and off and 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 i i do believe from the research i've done which is in 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 over 20 countries all over the world that one of the primary conditions of being queer um in 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 our era is, is, is toggling between that online and that offline um, uh, reality. Uh, in, in, in one zone, the online zone, things move incredibly fast. In the other zone, the offline zone, um, things move very slowly and, and needing to negotiate um, the, the, those, those differences is, is very much part of the queer condition in our times. So what I'm gonna do is begin with what I believe is a map of the pink line today. And you might ask me why, um, when I'm describing the pink line, am I showing you a map of the Ukraine war and Russia's invasion or attempted invasion of the Ukraine? And the answer for this is, 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 is lodged perhaps in um, some powerful um, statements 
that have been made recently that I want to share with you. Look at what Vladimir Putin said when he, um, when he started the war against the Ukraine. He said, the West sought to destroy our traditional values and force us on their false values that would erode us, our people from within, the attitudes they have been aggressively imposing on our countries, attitudes that are directly leading to degradation and degeneration because they are contrary to human nature. This is not going to happen. So what Putin is saying there is, is that one of the reasons why he um, invaded Ukraine was to save the Ukraine from the homosexualism of the West. And listen to the response from a Ukrainian politician, uh, Andriy Kozimyakin. And this is, by the way, a right-wing Ukrainian politician with a history of homophobia. But just last week, when, when a parliamentarian um, introduced into the Ukrainian parliament uh, a civil union bill that would, would, would grant same-sex couples the same rights as heterosexual couples. This parliamentarian, Mr. Koziamakin said, anything that our enemy hates, I will support. If it will never exist in Russia, it should exist and be supported here to show them and to signal to them that we are different. This law, the civil unions law, is like a smile towards Europe and a middle finger to Russia. So I support it. Now, these two, um, quotes, these two positions are really important in terms of understanding pink line politics. And the reason I say that is because on both sides, you have, I mean, maybe we are on the side of Mr. Koziamakin and not on the side of Putin, but we need to see when we look at these quotes that on both sides, it isn't really about us. It isn't really about LGBTQ people or queer people. It's about our rights being instrumentalized by people fighting another battle and using us to show the finger to Russia, to assert a Russian identity against the West for reasons that really have nothing to do or very little to do with our own um, uh, claims for equality. And I think that's really important to understand the way uh, that in, in this era, one of the features of the pink line, of the politics of the pink line, is the way our rights have been instrumentalized, maybe to our benefit on one side, I'm definitely to our benefit on one side, but we still need to understand the dynamics. What I like to say is, is that in this Ukraine war, the very first missiles that were fired over Ukraine airspace were homophobic missiles. And why do I say that? I say that because in 2014, when Ukraine uh, was uh, going through a referendum to decide whether it would join the EU, uh, Russian agents in Ukraine launched this huge campaign all over Ukraine. And here is one of the pieces of the campaign photographed in Kiev, a, a sign that says association with the EU means same-sex marriage. So you can see how that side was using it. Uh, here is a, a quote from, from somebody in that campaign. We oppose the signing of the association with the, agree uh, the association agreement with the EU, EU because it will lead to the inevitable homosexualizing of Ukraine. More recently, um, the um, Archbishop Kirill, uh, the head of the Russian Orthodox Church, has said that um, one of the reasons for the Ukraine invasion is to save Slavic peoples from gay pride marches. Now, this doesn't really have anything to do with queer people. This has to do with a whole lot of other reasons, with, with, with Russia's attempt to assert itself geopolitically, with Vladimir Putin's attempt to cement a relationship with the Russian Orthodox Church, with, um, with an attempt by the Russian government, uh, or in the case of Africa, if we look at Africa, by the Ugandan government or the Ghanaian government or the Nigerian government, to distract attention from things that really matter and really bother people, such as poverty and inequality and unemployment and hunger and rising inflation. Um, this is a very convenient way of distracting. Now, um, uh, it was lovely to hear Drew speak earlier about um, the, the map that's expanding and the flags that are expanding. And, and you probably know that just this week, um, really two days ago, uh, the latest country to join um, those countries that grant full equality to same-sex couples is Estonia. So on this map, you see Estonia 
uh, up there uh, next to Russia and under Finland as, as being light blue, because when this map was taken, there were still, still civil unions. But we can now make Estonia dark blue. And this is incredibly significant because Estonia is the first former Soviet country uh, to allow, to permit same-sex marriage. And, and Tallinn, the capital of Estonia, is only 350 kilometers from Leningrad. So at the same time as, as Estonia is, this is, this is a, a very graphic example of, of pink line politics and, and, and what happens on either side of the line. At the same time as Estonia is granting full rights to queer people, at the same time as Latvia, the country just beneath Estonia, has elected a, an openly gay president, just 200 kilometers, just across the border in Russia, um, the Russians, as really part of their, their campaign uh, uh, to, to, to repress, to conquer uh, uh, Ukraine and to assert totalitarianism, the Kremlin has increased its anti-gay propaganda, has expanded its anti-gay propaganda legislation so that now it is not only illegal to quote unquote promote homosexuality to minors, but to promote homosexuality to anybody. I think it's really interesting to, to, to read what the Estonian prime minister said upon the passing of, of same-sex marriage in Estonia. She said, my message to Central Europe is that it's a difficult fight, but marriage and love is something you have to promote. We have de developed a lot in these 30 years since we have freed ourselves from the Soviet occupation. We are equals among same value countries. She's, she's saying here that we are doing this as an act of liberation from our former oppressors, Russia, as well as because of the Soviet Union, as well as because we believe in the equality of everyone. There's a geopolitical agenda here, an anti-Russian agenda here, as much as there is an agenda of saying hello to Europe and of granting rights to Estonian people. Once more, we need to understand that. And we need to understand that within the context of global geopolitics. And for this reason, I've put up a historical map next to show you a map of the Cold War. And it's really interesting to me that, that when we look at these maps of LGBTQ equality today, we use um, blue and red in the same way as blue and red were used to show the Cold War of, of the past. And, and this, this, this provokes a, a response from some countries, particularly in the global south and particularly uh, in, the, in the east, in the former Soviet Union, from some actors in those countries to say that this is a new Cold War being fought by the West and this is a new form of neo-colonial oppression. And, and one of the things I do in my book is, is I examine that and I pass that. Because there is, a, we have to admit, a similarity between the Cold War, map, Cold War map of 1985 and a global culture wars map of today. This is a map that shows in blue uh, those countries where there are rights for LGBTQ people and those countries in, 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 a, in a sort of pinky red where there aren't. The, the, the notion of globalizing the culture wars um, has become a very prominent one in understanding what's happening in the world. And, and, and the really important work was done a few years ago by um, an amazing um, African Anglican cleric named Kapia Kawama from Zambia, who wrote a paper called Globalizing the Culture Wars, looking at the way that the United States and that particularly right-wing Christian actors in the United States have exported ideas, have exported the homophobic script, have exported a form of political homophobia from the United States to other parts of the world. And this is verifiable. This is verifiable in, in um, the way that homophobic legislation, such as the new um, uh, Anti-Homosexuality Act in Uganda that was passed just a couple of weeks ago came about, and the role that um, right-wing evangelical Christians played. It's also verifiable in through um, global organizations that, that, that began in the United States, such as the, the Congress for the Family, that, that really introduced Russian and, um, and Polish and Hungarian right-wing actors 
to this idea of how you could instrumentalize um, homophobia and, and, and create a, a new sort of coalition between right-wing politicians and churches struggling to remain relevant using homophobia globally. So this is a, this is a global phenomenon uh, that has its roots very much in the West. And that's incredibly important to understand, particularly when one wants to try and debunk or interrogate um, the notion that it is um, gay rights or trans rights that is something that's being promoted by the West. In fact, it's political homophobia uh, that comes from the West too. So let's ask the question, is the LGBTQ rights movement a form of Western cultural imperialism? And I want to show you two statements here that come out of Uganda. One that was made by Pastor Martin Semper, who, was one of, who, is, is, who is perhaps the, the chief homophobe in Uganda, the, the chief hater in Uganda. And he said um, just a couple of weeks ago, the president has shown great courage to defy the bullying of the Americans and Europeans. That bullying, uh, will, uh, that bullying we shall not give you money. They intimidate and threaten you. Now, what's really interesting about Martin Semper is that he gets the money for his work from Christian evangelical churches too. He actually trained in Texas. Uh, look at what President Museveni said when he signed the first anti-homosexuality bill into law in 2014. He said, there's now an attempt at social imperialism to impose social values. We're sorry to see that you, the West, live the way you live, but we keep quiet about it. Now, this is a really important statement and I come back to it a lot in my book. And I think what's important about it and one of the things we really have to grapple with and understand is that on one level, President Museveni is right when he says, we are sorry to see that you live the way you live, but we keep quiet about it. Because what we are seeing in the world, and we have to acknowledge this, is that there is something of a culture clash happening, that there are societies, homosexuality as we know, gender difference as we know, is universal. It's a function of the human condition. There is no society in the world where there are not homosexual people, where there are not gender non-conforming people. But different societies have dealt with this in different ways. And the reason why we're having these global culture wars now, the reason why there's a pink line is because there's a clash, because there are some societies or some people in some societies who still believe that you need to keep quiet about it, that you need to, you can do what you like on the down low, but you need to get married, have children, keep bloodlines going. If you are female bodied, uh, wear a dress and cover your head. If you are male bodied, you know, be the breadwinner, whatever. And that's being challenged. And we need to understand, this is, this is a complicated slide, so I'm not gonna to spend too much time on it, but we need to understand how um, the whole idea of Western art, of art LGBTQ identity comes from a particular Western tradition. It comes from capitalism and the industrial revolution, which led to urbanization which led to people um, moving away from the countryside and into the city and being able to practice personal autonomy. It comes from a particular um, scientific tradition uh, that, that leads us all the way up to a certain approach to medical gender transition today. That is something that was pioneered in the West. Uh, it comes from liberal democracy, and which, which created a certain human rights discourse, which, which in turn permitted uh, a, a kind of minority identity politics where um, it was actually in your interests to, to, to go, if, you're, if you were seeking election in a place like San Francisco or London or Amsterdam, to go after the gay vote because gay people could vote for you and put you into power. It comes from the mass media and entertainment and, 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 and the way that um, images of, um, of same-sex love, of transgender identity have been transmitted and popularized from Hollywood. All of this is created to the art LGBTQ identity that we now uh, take as our right in places like Sunderland or Cape Town. Uh, what I want to show is the way this has 
globalized though. And this is what I do in my book. So whereas before we might have had a Western art LGBTQ identity, we now have a global art LGBTQ identity. This is because primarily of the digital revolution. It's also because of mass migrancy and urbanization, because of global tourism, because of the way people travel. It's because of commodity capitalism, the way brands are sold, because of the entertainment industry, as I described, also very much because of human rights advocacy as foreign policy, because of the role that um, uh, non-governmental actors such as yourselves in report art play, because of the way that governmental actors such as the American government and the British government, controversially, yes, but the British government play, there is now something that we can call a global art LGBTQ identity. And therefore we have to revisit this idea that queer people in certain countries are foreign agents acting on behalf of the West. And to do this, what I do in my book is I juxtapose two quotes. And I think they're really important to look at together. The first quote is by the president of Senegal, an African country. Something he said um, to a German newspaper, but he said it repeatedly. He said something similar really just a couple of weeks ago. He said when he was asked um, why Senegal was not granting full rights to LGBTQ people. Uh, and he, by the way, has a human rights tradition. He's a good guy in the African context. He's somebody who came to power um, on the ticket of human rights. He says, you have only had same-sex partnerships in Europe since yesterday, and now you ask it today from Africans. This is all happening too fast. We live in a world that is changing slowly. So that's what Maki Sal says. But what I think is really revealing is, is the way he uses that word you. He's saying it's you people in the West who are asking us to change. Come to that, with what an amazing Ukrainian activist, Lena Shevchenko said to me. Uh, she said to me a few years ago that any um, queer activist in any country where there are not yet full rights would say something similar to this. She said to me, Ukrainian society might not be ready for LGBT rights, but our people cannot be restrained anymore. They go online, they watch TV, they travel, the world is moving so fast and events are overtaking us. We have no choice but to try and catch up. And the point here, the point I want to make is, is that it's an absolute fallacy to understand the core for a change in societies like Senegal, like Ukraine, like Russia, like Uganda, like Nigeria, as coming from the outside. It's coming from queer people in these countries themselves. And it's being supported by people on the outside. And it's coming from queer people in these countries themselves and people who believe and their allies because of the way the world has globalized, because of the way countries are not islands anymore. And this is really important in terms of understanding um, the way homophobia and transphobia is being um, instrumentalized today. It's being instrumentalized as a fight against neocolonialism because LGBTQ rights are seen as the most convenient symbol of global inequality. And as I think we will all agree, there is terrible increasing global inequality, but it's also a form of sovereignty anxiety in a world with ever diminishing borders. In countries where, where patriarchal presidents can no longer control their citizens because their citizens can go online, because their citizens can cross borders, this becomes a way of drawing a line around your borders, drawing a, a line around Uganda, drawing a line around Russia and saying, this is what makes us Russian as opposed to the rest of the world. It's also a form of patriarch anxiety. The kids or people don't listen to me anymore, so I have to assert my control over them. And finally, very importantly, it's a way of fueling moral panic. So it becomes a useful new scapegoat that presents itself that can be used for political purposes. And the script for this, I want to repeat, was written in the United States with Anita Bryant's Save Our Children from Homosexuality campaign in 1977. You got it in the UK. Those of you who are old enough will remember 
Margaret Thatcher in section 28. And Mrs. Thatcher saying, children need to be taught to respect traditional moral values. And instead they're being taught that they have an inalienable right to be gay. We have to stop that. That was the script. It comes from Anita Bryant and the conservative government of the United Kingdom. And it was exported to Russia and Russia's gay propaganda laws in 2013. It was exported to, to countries like Uganda and, and Nigeria in the way that they formulated their anti-homosexual legislation. And it's now gone back to the United States. And I want to end there in the few minutes I have left with Ron DeSantis's don't say gay legislation. Now I mentioned in Florida and, and in many, and it's starting in other states too. I mentioned that the pink line runs um, between countries, but it runs through countries too. And, the, and we could talk about the United Kingdom and I'm sure you have a lot to say about it, but let's just look in conclusion at the United States and at the way um, the, global cult, the global culture wars, particularly around sexual orientation and gender identity have repatriated uh, gone back to where it began in the United States. And look here at the blue states, which are states where there is protection for trans people, this, this slide particularly shows, and at the red states where there has been a slate of new laws that are making it tougher to be trans, particularly if you're a kid. Um, the, the Human Rights Commission, uh, the Human Rights Council, the LGBT organization in United States has spoken about a state of emergency for LGBTQ Americans. And just since 2020, just since 2020, there have been more than 650 bills at state level or local level targeting queer people. Just since 2020, 19 states have banned medical care for trans youth. 21 states have banned trans students participating in sports. Nine states have banned trans students from using bathrooms according to gender identity. And there's been the don't say gay legislation. What's happening here is that the pink line has shifted from the L and the G across the B to the T. And what's happening in the United States and elsewhere is that trans rights have become the new enemy the new threat to children. Because the way these homophobic and transphobic politics have worked since the days of Anita Bryant is, is that the way you rally the faithful, the way you show, um, the way you show your people that you are in control is you speak about protecting children. Now it used to be in Anita Bryant's day in the 1970s that you could speak about protecting children against homosexuals. But because of the way homosexuals and queer people have become normalized, normativized, due to the entertainment industry, due to Will and Grace and Modern Family and all those shows, due to same-sex marriage laws, due to the way society has changed, due to the fact that everybody, pretty much everywhere, knows somebody who's gay now, certainly in the West. It's much harder to demonize homosexuals, gay men and lesbians, as a threat to children because everybody knows homosexuals and everybody knows that they're not a threat to children. So the new demon is trans people and this thing called gender ideology. So we have what we're on in our new phase is the, is the transgender culture wars. And there's a new threat to children and families, which is trans people. And this is being promoted by a global anti-gender ideology movement that began in the Catholic church. That is where it began. Uh, and it has been embraced by the evangelical movement, by the Christian Orthodox movement. And it has its own iteration in the other monotheistic religions, um, in fundamentalist Islam. And we're seeing very terrifyingly in Israel today in a certain understanding of Judaism too. What is, what is really important, and I'm, I don't have time to talk about this now, but I imagine it's something you're going to be exploring a lot in, in your deliberations today, is the way one of the, one of the features of this new war is that it's a war on two fronts. Because on the one hand, you have the attacks from the Ron DeSantis's of the world. But on the other hand, you have the attacks of people who we thought were allies, so-called gender critical feminists who are, are fighting from another front against trans identity, also allegedly to save the children. That is a feature um, of this new generation, this new, this new, this new battle, um, this new era of 
gender culture wars. So in conclusion, um, I want us to think about two motions, uh, the arc and the pendulum. And I begin the statement, which is from an upcoming uh, article that I'm, that's gonna be published in the New York Times in a couple of weeks, uh, looking at these issues. It's a statement that I'm sure you're all familiar with. It's, it's a beautiful statement. It's a statement that was popularized by Martin Luther King, even though it's not his actual statement, uh, but he popularized it. And it's a statement that we all need to bear in mind if we're activists, because otherwise, why do we do it? And the statement is, the arc of the moral universe is long, but it bends towards justice. And what I write is, I write that we all need to believe these words, but that when it comes to LGBTQ rights, the motion I've discerned in my years of research is more that of the pendulum swinging. Rights are asserted, space is claimed, and then there is backlash. This is especially the case in societies where the foundation texts of monotheistic religions can be abused to fuel moral panics against queer people for political purposes. So on that note, I would like to leave you. Um, I don't know if we have time for questions, Drew, um, but I am open uh, to some questions now or for any communication that anybody wants to have with me online. I'm easy to find through my website. Thank you very much. Enjoy your conference, and I really do hope you get something out of reading my book. Cheers, Mark. Um, just before I direct people to what's happening next, does anybody have any questions on the back of that? Ah, Matt. Thank you. Mark, thanks so much. Um, I'm Matt Ian, I'm the executive director at All Out. Can you hear me? We have Matt Beard, the executive director from All Out. What's your question? I will so, feed it. Um, I just wanted to ask a question related to the final thing you said at the end about the pendulum. I, I'm worried that the pendulum is quite dramatically swinging back the other way at the moment. And just in terms of all your research, do you think there's a moment where we should look in the mirror and think about what maybe we've done wrong as a global movement over the last 10 years that may have caused that pendulum to swing in the wrong direction? So it's a moment of self-reflection, I guess. Did you hear that? Okay. I, I, I did. Thank you, Matt. Thank you for that question. I'm, I'm a huge admirer of the work that All Art does. I keep on doing it. Um, look, I, we, Two things. I, I would want. I would want to say two things, and and that is is that um, uh, the pendulum swings and the arc bends. That it's not like the one replaces the other, because there are certain things you cannot put back into a box. You know, it's really interesting for me to um, remain in touch with the people I interviewed at great length in Russia, because I have a chapter on Russia in, in my book. And, and to speak to my friends and comrades in Uganda, uh, which has just had this terrible new legislation. And what's interesting is that um, even if um, the national climate or the political climate changes, and even that if, even if that affects um, uh, your safety in a broader sense, uh, we, we all also live in islands, in small islands, and we all have small islands of support around us. And if you've come out to your family or you've come out to your neighbors or you've come out to your friends and they've accepted you or celebrated you, that remains. Um, so you can be forced back in publicly because of new laws. Um, but but, but in, in, in your own life, your, 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 the way you're accepted remains. And that remains the seed, the germ um, for, for the future growth once the pendulum swings again. Because that's the other thing I'd say about a pendulum swinging. A pendulum never stops swinging, right? And, and, and I think we need to understand this as, as something existential and eternal, this pendulum swinging that um, we will continue wherever we are to make the claims for our rights. Uh, we cannot not. It's, it's, a, it's a force of nature. It's a force of physics. That being said, you're absolutely right. Let's get to the meat of your question. You're absolutely right that we need to look in the mirror all the time, all the time. 
and not in a narcissistic self-interested way, but in a way of trying to understand what has happened and why. Now, there are certain things beyond um, uh, your control as people from the global uh, West who are promoting um, international solidarity. Uh, you cannot control how someone like Vladimir Putin or Martin Semper might want to use um, your um, campaign to fight their own battles. Um, but clearly, clearly, the uh, most powerful way to counter their battles is for queer Ugandans or queer Russians or queer Ukrainians or queer um, Nigerians to speak up and for their allies to speak up, their parents, uh, their pastors, their neighbors, their employers. And, and I suppose um, if one were to look in the mirror, an absolutely critical thing for international solidarity organizations and government actors to do. And I know, for example, that you at All Out and you and Report Out already do this. So you've already looked at the mirror, is to think about how the statements calling for rights come from Ugandans uh, and Russians themselves, uh, rather than, or more powerfully than, statements that you might make. Um, so that, so that um, your campaigns aren't abused or, or that you can limit the way your campaigns um, are abused by actors, by haters, who will use your campaigns to show that this is something coming from the West. Well, you, thank you. Um, do we have can we, one more question before we, and then I, need, I know our, our speakers are getting nervous. Um, very quickly, please, Joanne. As a humanist, Marxist, uh, and human rights activist who travels around the world quite often, how do we go and defend ourselves against a UK government that's got an undeclared official war against intersexual people like me and trans kids, trans people? I'll give you an instance. I was in a restaurant yesterday where I had a woman literally shouting across. Uh, Trans men are not men, trans women aren't women. So I got my own reward back by saying trans rights now, shouting going out the door. So it's at the end of the day, it's getting to be such a toxic um, atmosphere if you're part of the intersexual or transgender community in the UK, by you be beaten up on the streets. So how do we defend ourselves from right-wing politicians who seem to weaponize us? Mm. Look, I, th thank you for that, and I mean it's 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 devastating to hear that 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 first hand personal testimony. I'm so sorry. Um, the the context of that testimony, I, I I can't say if this is true in your case because I don't know you, but the context of that of that testimony, from what I've seen elsewhere, is that um, what has triggered this toxicity, whether it's in the United Kingdom in the way you're describing or elsewhere in the world, is people such as yourself refusing to hide anymore, it, refusing to be quiet anymore, insisting on being yourselves. And there are only two ways forward. One is to go into hiding again, which is firstly impossible for most people and secondly, defeat. And the second is to fight your corner the way you did and to draw um, allies around you as you fight your corner and to draw allies around you using science, using reason um, and to take faith in, in, I mean, I just saw very interesting research from the United States, which, which shows that it, it, it shows that even as the state of emergency is expanding against LGBTQ people and specifically trans and gender nonconforming people and intersex people, um, 
even as that is happening, the numbers are showing that in terms of what people actually think, an increasing number, an increasing majority believes in the rights, the full rights of trans people. So there's this disconnect between what uh, certain right-wing actors, such as the Trumps and the DeSantis's, um, uh, uh, express and what people actually think. And, 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 and smart politics is, is, is about figuring out how to reach what you could call the silent majority. The people who didn't shout at you, the people who kept quiet but thought, this is terrible. Why is this happening? Why is another human being being treated in this way? Because, because the empirical evidence shows that's, that's what most people think. And that most people think that because you have come out, because you are refusing to hide, because people see that you exist in a way that they didn't. I, that's a, it's a, it, that's a, a partial answer. And we could talk a lot more about this. I know I, know I have to go. So I'm going to try not to ramble, but, but I thank you for sharing that. And I, I thank you for your courage.